Next we go into therapy. Some questions came in about that. So we can start with kind of the basics of this idea of cognitive behavioral therapy. And if we go back in history to people like Albert Ellis and Aaron Beck, who were initially doing more psychoanalysis and uh, hearing Beck's description of one day kind of going off the rails and decided, I'm just gonna ask some different kinds of questions <laughs> instead of this analysis piece. And, he said suddenly that patient got better and did a lot better faster than he would have ever predicted in analysis. And uh, in fact, if, if you want to hear a little interview on that, uh, there's a podcast called Invisibilia. It's the word invisible with I-A at the end. I and love that podcast. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. And the, the first two episodes of season one are a really nice example of OCD mm -hmm. and fear and and discussions with Beck and everything too. Yes. Also Tom Corboy, who's out in Los mm -hmm. Angeles, who has an OCD clinic, talking about some of the exposure therapy treatment too. So. Yeah, one of my OCD patients actually clued me into that and I started listening it, and I got hooked. Yeah, yeah it's really great. It's great. So, so the concept of cognitive behavioral therapy, and all of us have a different really kind of way of looking at it, but the basics are all the same as I would say it from my way, and then I'll, please jump in. Okay. Um, there are three things we're gonna look at. There are the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you behave, and recognizing that all of them influence each other. And from my standpoint of it, because I'm more of an exposure therapist, which we'll get to in a minute, is really, for me, focusing on what is it that we can do to intervene in the way somebody behaves that will kind of help to alter the way they think and feel. Instead of trying to change the way somebody thinks, because, boy, that's tough. Right? Yeah. <laughs> or feels. I mean, try uh, try having a, a, a conversation with a Cubs fan when you're a White Sox fan and yeah. see if you can change each other's mind about it. It's, <laughs> it's just not going right, to work. Right. And you're not going to change their feelings about it either. But mm -hmm. maybe behaviorally would be the only way to go. Like, if you brought me to Cubs games or I brought you to Sox games, I might change my mind a little bit. But that's probably going to be the only way it's going to happen. It's not going to be you hours and hours telling me why you like the Cubs. Yeah, yeah, those it's late good. night conversations. Yeah, mm -hmm. which we've tried actually, and they, they still don't work. Don't yeah. work. So, uh, so the cognitive behavioral therapy model was really kind of revolutionary instead of trying to figure out why everything was happening and looking at old Freudian ideas of toilet draining and relationships with your mother, but just taking a look at what's going on now and what are the things that we can do in the moment to work on changing those things. and. As Beck was looking at in the cognitive piece, do we really have evidence to support what we're thinking? And I would say some of the new wave stuff is, who even cares what we're thinking? Because it's probably ridiculous anyway, right? If you want to add on that. But. Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, this time, because I, 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 I'm, I'm stuck on another thought, uh, along ahead. with your, mm -hmm. you know, how the, the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors interact. And so when I'm talking to a, a new patient, <laughs> <clears throat> and we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy, I, I tend to tell them, because we're, we're very heavily exposure-based as well, and especially for certain disorders such as OCD, cognitive therapy isn't a wonderful intervention because you're trying to, it's, you're, you're arguing with OCD, and Patrick and I can't even convince each other of something. It's, it's, it's a harder to convince your, your own brain that's you know creating this often bizarre scenario in your mind, doesn't make any sense. People with OCD know that, but it's just like this feeling. So we've got to get people to work through the fear of doing things. And so I tell people what we do is more, you know, little c, big B therapy. So yes. it's the, the learning by doing rather mm -hmm. than sitting in, you know, worksheets are helpful to, sure. you know, in, in some cases, especially if we're treating co-occurring conditions like Absolutely. depression and things mm -hmm. like that. But uh, we tend to rely a lot on getting people uh, activated, doing the things that they need to do to enjoy themselves. If it's a it's for depression, and depression coincides with OCD, uh, what is it, like 66 to 75% of the time? Pretty similar, yeah, right around there. Around there so. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah, we try to, uh, we, we learn by doing, it's how a lot of people learn best, so we don't have, you know, it's not just a, a lecture course on OCD and here's why you should think differently, it's let's go out and actually do some stuff. I like some of the examples, though, of just looking at it from the cognitive piece first, so uh, the, the notion that you and I kind of wrote down here is this idea that if we hear a noise downstairs, we, we might automatically think, how wonderful, someone's home. <laughs> or we might think, oh, the dog knocked something over. Or we Again. might think, oh crap, somebody just broke in my house. And, 
and the different ways of interpreting that one experience mm -hmm. can kind of show maybe where we're kind of bent toward things. And and if we've got an anxiety disorder, we're likely bent toward that third one of, oh my gosh, somebody's breaking in and I'm gonna go check things and, and all of that kind of or stuff. And you'd go check things if you thought somebody was breaking in? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. I would run and hide. You would run and well, uh, that's the difference between you and me. I know, so, right? <laughs> but about it I, I've always liked it like this, and I, I liked your, your statement about kind of the argument piece of it. You know, if you think of, OCD as the what if, and then us trying to give the logical answer, there will always be another yeah, but yeah, what, what if, if that will right. follow any logical answer. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how many logical answers we have to OCD, there's always a yeah, but what if, to right. it, which is why we're never going to convince it to think differently or right. be different. We have to show it. And those two words are also the reasons that you and I will never run out of business. Right, <laughs> exactly. Even though we try to, we'd yeah, love we, to work we ourselves, we out, of ourselves out of the job. So exposure therapy, which to us is really the gold standard of treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder, and it's really exposure and response prevention. And really what we're doing is two things. We're exposing people to things they're afraid of, which is what most people think of it as. But if you're a clinician who's just got a little smattering of that, that's where you're dangerous because mm -hmm. you really have to do the response prevention piece. And, and my mentor, Alec Pollard, said exposure and response prevention without response prevention is useless. Right. E minus RP equals zero. Equals this zero, talk. absolutely. Yeah. E minus RP equals zero. So what is response prevention? It's the elimination of avoidance, reassurance, distraction, and substance use, or any other immediately gratifying thing that you might do in the moment to feel good and to, to make that obsession. Anxiety. Yeah. yeah, make mm -hmm. that obsession go away.